Hello students and welcome to module three, which is the philosophy of religion. This will be a pretty in-depth and intense module. So there may be times when you have to stop this video and either replay a certain portion to get your notes complete, or you may want to fast forward to certain portions, but here we go. Since recorded history, people have had a conception of the divine. In fact, the philosophical method of inquiry in no small way was born out of a response to the tradition of attributing reality to God. However, there came a tension between philosophy and religion that still exists today. This tension escalated after the Renaissance when scientists began to rely upon naturalism as a means to explain truth and reality. What is true? Well, there is still philosophical inquiry motivated by religious concern. The search for truth is often tied to the questions about the divine and our relation to it. Some have argued that there is no God, while others give convincing arguments for the existence of God. The traditional concept of the single God is anthropomorphic. That is, we describe God in terms of our own attributes and characteristics. There are three major attributes. These are the omnipotent, which means all-powerful, the omniscient, which means all-knowing, and the omnipresent, which means the divine God is all-present everywhere. Now, this single God concept is the concept accepted by Jews, Christians, and Islam. However, the Romans, Greeks, Norse, and many tribal communities believed in multiple gods and goddesses. Monotheism is the belief in one God, but polytheism is the belief in multiple gods. Do you believe? In this module, you will learn that there are different types and varying degrees of belief in God. The three such beliefs that we will cover are the atheist. This is the belief of no God. The deist, the belief that God did and create the world, but has no personal interest in humans. And the theist, this is the belief that God exists. Now, if God is good and loving, why does he allow evil and suffering in our world? This is the very question at the root of many arguments against Christianity. There is no one answer that will satisfy all the critics, but several key ideas may be considered to address this question from all the angles. If someone believes in the existence of evil, then do you realize that that person must also believe there is a good? Without goodness, there would be no distinction between good or evil. If one believes in goodness, then he must also believe in a moral code of law. This defines what we believe as goodness. If a moral code exists, then there must be a source of that moral code. Believers and theists believe that this source is God. The very argument against God due to the existence of evil and suffering can actually be used to show that there is a higher moral source or God which must logically exist. Now the question is not really whether God caused evil and suffering. The issue is more that evil is not of God. Norman Geisler explains this in the book When Skeptics Ask that God is the author of in everything. Many have mistakenly believed that evil is a thing. They believe God created or allowed evil and suffering in the world, but evil is not a created object. Evil is a deficit. It is a lacking in something. Evil can be likened to a parasite that cannot exist alone, but only as a whole in something that should be solid. Evil arose from free will, according to Geisler. If God did indeed create all things perfect, then this creation must include a free will. The notion is that God created mankind with free will, which did make evil possible. Only mankind's act of freedom to sin made evil actual. 
Evil and suffering are a direct result of wrong choices brought about by the willful disobedience to God. If mankind did not have a free will, he would have been a slave, and slavery would not have been a perfect creation in the sense of God's love. Now, perhaps neither faith nor philosophy can ever truly be successful without the other. Religion has inspired some of the best art and most fascinating philosophy in history. In this module, we will be devoted to understanding the link and the tension between faith and philosophy. One interesting aspect was created by a French philosopher called Pascal. He called it Pascal's Wager. First, Pascal's Wager by Blaise Pascal, he was also a mathematician and scientist, he argued that belief in God is the safest bet in all things considered. Then there is Voltaire. Voltaire was a leading philosopher of the French Enlightenment who provided a deistic notion that God is necessary for the first two laws of physics. And did you realize that Thomas Jefferson, our third American president, was a deist? He believed that God existed for the first principle of physics. Another interesting person in philosophy that we will cover is C.S. Lewis. Many of you may know him as an author. He was actually born into a Protestant family and his grandfather was a minister, but his mother died when he was only nine and he became disillusioned because God did not answer his prayer to heal his mom. So he was sent away to boarding school during which he was verbally and physically abused by a caretaker who also claimed to be a clergyman. Next, he was sent to a preparatory school and he even experimented with the occult under the guidance of a school matron that he calls Miss C in his biography. He then denounced Christianity during preparatory school. He completed school at home then at last under a tutor named William Kirkpatrick who was an atheist. So you can see C.S. Lewis was exposed to a lot of different religious beliefs. He then was called into the army and he was served and wounded in World War I. After that, he completed university and took a teaching position in Oxford, England, and became close friends with the likes of J.R.R. Tolkien. He then at that time became a theist and eventually became a Christian at approximately 33 years old. This shows us of a journey of an individual. Another individual is Charles Darwin. Did you know that Darwin was actually raised Anglican and he, became, he actually considered being a pastor or clergy as a profession? He went on to earn a BA at Cambridge and he studied theology. In 1859, he published The Origins of Species, which many of you are familiar with from science. Now, Darwin did not think of himself as an atheist, though. He considered himself agnostic which meant he was seeking the answer to the divine. Darwin did not think that evolution and belief in God were mutually exclusive. He went on to marry Emma Wedgwood, and he still supported his local parish church, but he did not attend regularly. Darwin believed God was the source of our laws and the ultimate lawgiver. Claims that Darwin reverted back to Christianity on his deathbed are refuted by his children, though. Another interesting philosopher on this subject is Soren Kierkegaard. He was a theologian and a philosopher, and he is known as the father of existentialism. He devoted his life to spelling out what it means to be a Christian. He believed that faith is personal. It's not a doctrine. It's not church. It's not social group or ceremony. His earliest writings were written under a pseudonym because he thought his beliefs were inflammatory. We already mentioned Voltaire. He was indeed a leading philosopher of the French Enlightenment and he promoted religious tolerance. Although he was continuously at war with his own Catholic Church of France, 
Voltaire was a deist, which meant he believed God was a creator, but not individually involved in a person's life on the day to day. He rejected the institution of Christianity. He once bragged that he could show the church how that it could be destroyed by one man, even though it was established by 12. Voltaire described himself as an enemy of the church, but he also thought atheism was unthinkable. We also mentioned Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. He too was raised as a child in church. He was a member of the Church of England. When it was de-established after the American Revolution, he began to attend the Episcopal Church, and he was very interested in theology, religion, and morality. He acknowledged an adoring, overruling providence, or the divine, in his first inaugural address. Now, Jefferson also considered himself a deist and did not believe the biblical accounts of miracles were accurate. So he composed his own Bible by taking a current Holy Bible and excluding the portions that included miracles of Jesus and any portions that stressed strong morals. Jefferson did not believe in miracles. He did not believe the divinity of Jesus as the Son of God, nor the idea of Trinity. So he simply removed those in his version of the Bible. Now, this traditional Western concept that we have of God includes one God for the most part. It includes a male personification of God. It includes a God that is anthropomorphic, which means it has characteristics that we as humans can understand. And he remains a mystery. We also say that God is transcendent which means he's beyond the ordinary world and outside of ourselves. In the Old Testament scriptures, God existed before creating the world, and some believe that we cannot directly relate to God, that we only relate to his representatives, such as a pope, a king, a minister, a pastor, a priest, etc. Martin Luther believed that one's relationship to God must be direct and personal, he began a movement called Reformation and was actually excommunicated from the Catholic Church in 1521. Gustavo Gutierrez founded a movement in Latin America which contends that relationship to God requires helping the poor and the oppressed. Eminence. Eminent means not outside of us or distinct from the universe. Some believe in panentheism. Panentheism is that God transcends the world, but he dwells in every part of it. However, there is another view that is just simply pantheism, and pantheism holds that God is everything, identical to the universe. A staunch supporter of pantheism is Baruch Spinoza. Spinoza's views parallel Eastern religions such as Buddhism. Buddhists believe that God cannot be separate from the universe. And the Hindu says that the Brahman or their God are everywhere, even in the animals and the lower forms of life. George Heigl defended the idea that God must be a spirit. This can be explained like the emotion that one feels by team spirit. Yay, go team! The view of spirit is one that includes all humanity. It's bigger than any one person, but not distinct from people. Then some believe George that God is a process, like George Heigl. He believed God as a spirit could not be comprehended just in the present. He believed it's a presence or a becoming or self-creating universe. This view comes from ancient Egyptians in 1300 BC. They argued that God was continually self-creating or revealing himself. God as creation. We already said that the deist view that God created the world and has no personal role with his creation. This view of God portrays him more of an impersonal force who is indifferent to the concerns and everyday feelings of human beings. 
Soren Kierkegaard believed God had to be one's total commitment, requiring that he called a leap of faith. Kierkegaard's leap of faith is a view that says one cannot really know God but must act with confidence. In this, God is sometimes called a great unknown and is only believed by faith. Some believe God is our compass of morality. The moral features of God are the most universally accepted. The Ten Commandments are the basis for much of the early law in the United States. However, there is the problem of evil in the world. This is the question about God's goodness. If he's so good, why is there evil and suffering in the world? The argument goes as on this slide. If he's supremely good, then he must have the desire to eliminate evil. If he's omnipotent, then he has the power to eliminate evil. If he's omniscient, then he knows that evil exists, and he must know how to eliminate it. Therefore, if God is, exists and is supremely good, omnipotent, and omniscient, then evil must not exist, but evil does exist. Therefore, a supremely good, omnipotent, and omniscient God does not exist. This is the question between believers and non-believers. First, one must distinguish between two different kinds of evil. Philosophy distinguishes evil as moral from non-moral. Some even deny evil and suffering, such as some people believe the Nazis did not uh, murder millions of Jews, but we know that history and archaeological discoveries prove this. Some who suffer are said to have brought pain upon themselves, but the two kinds of evil that philosophy look at would be the non-moral or natural evil. This is only evil when it's looked at from a human perspective, such as an earthquake or a volcano or a hurricane. It's very arbitrary. Then there's the moral evil. This is caused by people, humanity turning away and hurting others. C.S. Lewis, that great writer again, who was a Christian but was a former atheist, said that God must allow suffering because we are like blocks of stone out of which the sculptor carves the form of man. Blows of his chisel, which hurt us so much, are what make us perfect. So, what is the answer to this problem of evil? There have been a number of answers given through history. Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz asserted that some pain is needed to indicate when we are in danger, like if your skin gets next to a fire. He said that God chose the world with the least amount of suffering. Then there's the aesthetic solution. This explains that we should look at the big picture or the overall canvas of life. Some suffering is required due to the process of life, like the lion that would eat the smaller animal. Some believe in the free will solution. This was covered earlier in the video that said God created humans with free will. Their choices sometimes lead to evil or suffering. Some believe that the answer of evil will be answered in the afterlife, that there will be justice. This is the belief that life is more of a test and that the good are rewarded and the wicked are punished in the afterlife. Some believe in God's mysterious ways. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, it says that we cannot comprehend God's full thoughts because they are above and more powerful than our thoughts. Some believe that evil is just working out the answer and there is no perfect answer. All answers can be debated. The religions of Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, other Asian religions, and Christianity have all sought to answer this problem. If your philosophy believes in God and you are a theist, then you should determine which moral qualities you believe he has and whether these can be compatible with the existence of evil and suffering at the world. Because at some point you may be faced with the question and need an answer. 2 Timothy 4.2 of the New Testament says, Be prepared in season and out of season. 
1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be ready to give an answer for what you believe. Some believers consider their belief rational, while others insist God cannot be rationally known. How one relates to God depends on their concept of Him. This occurs for the atheist with no belief also. If you do not believe in God, which concepts of God do you not believe in? St. Einselm was a Benedictine monk who became the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he gave us the ontological argument. This is an argument built upon the nature of existence itself. His philosophy was faith, seeking, and understanding. Only through faith could we start to understand. His ontological argument was this. Number one, we can think of a being greater than any other being, and he called this the GPB, the greatest possible being. We all know that existence in reality is superior to existence in the mind alone. So if a being exists only in the mind, then there has to be a greater being in reality. Therefore, the GPB must exist in reality, not just in the minds of people. This concept is the one of God. God must be the greatest possible being. Therefore, God is the GPB and exists in reality. St. Thomas Aquinas was a 13th century theologian from Italy. He devised five different proofs for God's existence. One dated back to Aristotle. His great work was called the Summa Theologica, and he gave us the cosmological argument. This is the argument that everything must be created or caused by someone else. His first way is the argument taken from motion, back from the ancient Greek Aristotle. Aristotle believed that all moving things had to have a source of motion. There must have been some original source unmoved by anything else. This is what St. Thomas Aquinas called God the unmoved mover. The second argument was from causality. Everything which exists must have had a cause for its existence. There cannot be an infinite chain of causes stretching back far into the past. So there must have been some first cause before anything else was caused. And this we call God, the uncaused cause. The third way is the argument from contingency. Everything which exists is dependent on something else for its existence, and it might at some stage not exist, such as a human life that is born and then dies. At one stage, everything did not exist. There must be something dependent on nothing else, the source of all others, and this we call God who must exist. These are three of the ways that St. Thomas Aquinas argued his belief in the existence of God. William Paley uh, gave the teleological argument. Teleological arguments are an argument from design. The intricate design requires a creator. And William Paley argued that this creator is like a watchmaker. Let's say you find a watch and you see it's very complex. You knew some intelligent being had to be this watchmaker. Paley noted that many things in nature are way more complex than a watch. So there had to be an intelligent creator. Immanuel Kant gave the moral argue, argument for belief. Kant rejected the others, the ontological, cosmological, and teleological proofs for God. He believed that God is rationally necessary for anyone who wishes to be a moral and good person. He came to this argument and called it a posteriori argument. He criticized all the others, and he said that human reasoning is limited, but God is unlimited, so he's beyond our understanding. We just need to believe in him because of the practical reason of morality. Again, a reminder about Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician. Um, he gave us the wager. The wager tells us either we do believe or we don't believe. 
If we do believe in God exists, then we go to heaven. Good. If we do believe in God doesn't exist, then nothing will happen. That's still not bad. However, if we don't believe and God does exist, we go to hell. And if I don't believe and God doesn't exist, nothing happened. To Pascal, out of these four conclusions, one was really bad. I go to hell. So he lived his life to avoid that one, which meant that he did believe in God. Soren Kierkegaard, that we had mentioned earlier, had what he called an irrational faith. And he said that the proof of God's existence are when people act irrationally. He used the example of Abraham from the Old Testament when he was asked to kill his own son Isaac. But somehow Isaac did remain alive as a confirmation of God's love. Kierkegaard emphasized that Abraham's faith was irrational and incompatible with reason. So he believed and concluded that faith has to be a commitment to do the irrational in the name of God. He also believed, like Meister Eckhart of the 14th century, that there are three dimensions of knowledge which lead one to belief. A mystic. Mysticism is another irrational faith belief. It says that one comes to faith or belief in God due to a special experience or a vision. Meister Eckhart said, God is at home. It's we who have gone out for a walk. And again, he was the one who believed in three dimensions of knowledge that lead one to belief. Three dimensions of knowledge that Eckhart believed were the sensual, that the eyes can see at a distance, the intellect that we have, which makes us higher in rank to animals, and the soul, which is the entity that ranks so high that it communes with God face to face, according to Eckhart. Now, as you can see, this is a deep chapter, and it involves many, many different beliefs, and we are only scraping the surface of religious beliefs. But when you talk about religion, you need to remember that religion plays a central role in many people's outlook on the world. But it does not play a central role in everyone's view. There are many different religious outlooks and very different religious practices. So we must understand the power and importance of religion and not presume that everyone has the same outlook. We must have tolerance. Remember some of the basic features of a religion are, number one, most have a ritual. There are some religious practices or routines that are um, practiced by all, monotheism, polytheism, Western belief of God, or the Eastern belief. Two, there are traditions. A tradition is the transmission of beliefs from generation to generation. Some traditions are given along in a scripture. Some are given verbally. And three, there is a sense of spirituality. This is the feeling that we are part of something greater than ourselves as opposed to material or physical things. In this world, be sure that there will be times when religion goes against the cause of science or of non-belief. This case study is one in intelligent design that we will end the chapter on. In November 2004, the Dover Area School District in Pennsylvania voted and they were going to require all ninth grade teachers to read a statement to students before they gave their science instruction. However, the teachers refused and filed a lawsuit. The lawsuit was Kitzmiller versus the Dover Area School District. Here was the statement that they were asked to read. The Pennsylvania academic standards require students learn about Darwin's theory of evolution and eventually take a standardized test of which evolution is a part. Because Darwin's theory is a theory, it is still being tested as new evidence is discovered. The theory is not a fact. Gaps in the theory exist for which there is no evidence. 
A theory is defined as a well-tested explanation that unifies a broad range of observations. Intelligent design is another explanation of the origin of life that differs from Darwin's. The reference book of Pandas and People is available for students to see if they would like to explore this other view in an effort to gain an understanding of what intelligent design actually involves. As you can tell, this struck a nerve and many scientific teachers did not want to show an alternate theory of creation. As is true with theory, students were still supposed to keep an open mind and the school was going to leave the discussion of the origin of life to the students and their families. But the district was sued and the teachers did win and the statement was never read before the science class. This reminds us in all things we should continue to respect one another as we differ in our religious beliefs. It is an answer that every individual person has to answer for himself or herself. Do you believe in the divine or not? If you believe, what do you believe? And if not, why not? What do you not believe? This will be a deep chapter, so study hard and keep working.